my name's Sam Austin uh, from Red Horse Products in the UK. I'm here to talk, obviously, a bit about microbial issues on the horse's foot and uh, our recommended treatment protocols. Um, I'm sure that you all have your own methods of treating these issues, um, ones that you're probably happy with, but also you probably do have the odd occasion when you just can't get on top of a, an issue with the foot, or you've got one that recurs no matter what you do, and hopefully we'll give you a few new ideas um, as to why you get recurrent problems, why things work, and why some others don't. Um, so when we're talking about microbial infections, we're talking about the uh, deep central sulcus, uh, which is often a thrush infection, surface thrush on the foot, white line diseases, CD toe, and in the extreme, canker. Um, so what's causing these infections? Don't like to get too hung up on whether it really is fungus, bacteria, yeasts, viruses, etc. What it most often is, is some kind of keratolytic microbe, which just means it destroys keratin on the foot. And usually the worst of these are anaerobic, which means they thrive in low oxygen, low air atmospheres. It's often understood, we think nowadays, that white line disease is mostly fungal and Thrush is usually bacterial. Obviously, it's going to depend hugely on where you are in the country, where you are in the world, what your soil is like as to what the prevalent microorganisms are in your general area. So we don't like to really make too many generalizations about this. So microbes cause the infections. They thrive in particular kinds of environments. Uh, usually warm, moist, low oxygen atmospheres with high organic material levels in them. And that can be feces or soil. Can also be the underside of the horse's foot, which provides a foodstuff and a habitat for them. And that's where poor care and hygiene is, is a big factor, lack of picking out the feet, etc. Um, because it produces more porous tissue for these microbes to live in. Think in terms of what is better for supporting bacteria, a porous damp sponge or a dry, hard marble surface. Nutrition is certainly a factor. It's not my area of expertise, um, but this can be mineral deficiencies I'm always very wary of telling people to feed more balancers or, or, or increase nutrition levels without them first having checked the mineral level, levels in their horse's diet first, because it can be that they have too much of a particular mineral or there's an imbalance. Um, cavities, so white line cavities, deep central sulcus cavities provide perfect habitats for microbes. Uh, so these are a, a, a quite a regular cause of them. And a, a fairly new thing is microbial imbalance. In our guts and on our skin, we know that we have a mixture of good and bad bacteriums. Uh, the bad bacteria tend to be pathogenic, cause disease, whereas the good bacteria often feed on those bad bacteria and keep the balance in check and keep the bad bacteria in check. It, it would be naive to think that wasn't the case on the equine foot as well. Uh, so we need to keep in mind that we want good bacteria to thrive on those feet. So what treatments do we want to use when we've got a microbial infection? The first, and I want really the take home thing from this to be is to do no harm. Uh, the treatments that we feel are the most effective and, and do the best job immediately and seem to clear everything up are often the ones that do the most damage to the foot in the long term. And in turn, 
they provide more of an environment for bacteria and fungi to reinfect. Um, so we always want to be thinking of the long game in our treatment methodology. Products like uh, formalin and iodine can be drying and, and cause microscopic fissures in the feet. Um, tea tree, yep, even natural products can be bad, can be very allergenic, can be very harmful to good bacteria, can be very drying to the feet as well. Uh, peroxide and copper sulfate, very effective antimicrobials, um, but burn or damage tissue when used in effective concentrations. Oil-based products can trap moisture into the foot tissue, which in turn keeps oxygen out, which gives you this anaerobic environment in which microbes can thrive again. Strong solvent solutions can break down the lipid barriers in the horse's foot, which normally protect the foot from moisture infiltration. And if these are damaged by strong solvents, then you can get more moisture infiltration into the foot tissue, which again is ideal for microbes. Do you need to go nuclear with your treatment methods? Sometimes you do. Sometimes these are the correct approaches, but in a regular everyday occurrence, they probably aren't. You might need to use these post or preoperatively when you really need to know that every microbe has been removed from the foot. Um, or you might need to use copper sulfate with a particular stubborn case of, uh, of canker. Uh, that needs to bridement. Um, there is good news. There are active ingredients that you can use that have a good short-term effect and a very good long-term effect. And we'll go on to talk about what our protocol would be for dealing with microbial infections. Firstly, and obviously, removal of packed dirt and dead tissue. The dead tissue is providing food material and habitat for microbes to live on. So it has to be debrided. Um, and you are also producing a barrier that prevents whatever active ingredient you are using on the foot getting to the areas you want to treat. It doesn't really matter that microbes are living on dead tissue. They're not doing any damage. It's the microbes that are attacking the live tissue that you're concerned about. So you need to get rid of the dead tissue so you can treat the live tissue. So you want to eliminate the surface microbes, or at least the negative ones, with a do no harm type of ingredient. Good active ingredients to use would be zinc sulfate, eucalyptus oil, and other essential oils, but selectively. Um, do some research first, because as I said, some like tea tree can be too aggressive. Zinc oxide is very effective, especially on anaerobic microbes. And honey, simple, effective, natural, um, but very aggressive towards, an towards uh, anaerobic microbes. As well as that treatment on the surface, you want to assure that you are drawing out the deeper infection. Now, I'm not talking about abscesses here. I'm talking about thrush. It is an anaerobic bacteria that will burrow as deep as it can into the hoof tissue because it is always looking to escape the air and the oxygen that is on the surface of the foot. This is how you get these blackened veins that we've all seen on a regular basis, but where the surface of the foot may appear completely healthy. Now, we can't debride all of those. We can't dig them all out. So you want to try and bring the infected tissue out to the surface so you can treat it. This is where drawing agents like mineral-based clays, uh, kaolinite or a bentonite clay, uh, obviously it's got to be in, it, in its liquid form rather than its dry form to be truly effective. Uh, salts, especially magnesium sulfate, Epsom salts, 
uh, again, could be made into a paste very effectively. Even warm poulticing to an extent, because uh, obviously uh, a hot poultice can uh, easily make the foot too wet and produce more of a porous environment for bacteria to reinfect. You could also, again, cons consider honey in this, because anything that's high in sugar will have a drawing effect. Sugar pastes, similarly, can be very effective too for this. Then you want to provide some kind of barrier to the t dirt or microbes. Again, you want to avoid this barrier being an oil-based or producing a complete barrier to moisture that can seal moisture in itself. This is where, again, clay bases or honey bases can be very useful uh, because they don't completely block moisture. They help balance it. Uh, but they provide a good physical barrier to uh, microbial infiltration and, uh, and just to, to dirt buildup. This is an example of, uh, this is Artemud medicated clay putty. You can see it very clearly on the radiograph at the toe. That's packed into a, a white line cavity uh, to treat the tissues whilst preventing any, uh, any foreign matter getting in there. You also want to promote regrowth. Admittedly, this isn't too much of an issue with surface thrush. Um, because pressure and stimulation just of moving around will usually achieve that. But where you have a very deep white line cavity or a deep central sulcus cavity, um, you don't have pressure within that cavity. And it's very hard to create pressure within that cavity. So there isn't much circulation. So there isn't much stimulus for growth. This is where uh, our approach is to use a fibrous packing material. Now, this can be cotton, it can be hemp, but it must be well soaked in a, a medicated active ingredient. Otherwise, it could provide a, just a new habitat for microbes to grow on. Um, and whatever that antimicrobial is that you've treated the fiber with, uh, it's got to be quite aggressive against anaerobes. So again, a, a zinc oxide or, or honey, which is very effective against the, uh, against the microbes. It's an example of uh, a medicated fiber being packed into a deep central sulcus to provide ongoing antimicrobial effect at the same time as providing stimulus for regrowth. We so often find that especially these deep central sulci are actually really quite easy to remove infection from, but they are very, very hard to make grow back. And that's often because we're using things that are detrimental to, to the tissue regrowth and we're not applying the pressure that the tissue needs to regrow. Tissue healing agents, um, this we're really talking about things like honey and, and again zinc oxide as a tissue healing agent, even aloe vera. Um, although this has to be quite concentrated because you can just end up introducing too much moisture into the situation if you're not careful. Right, so once you've gone through your treatment protocol, Hopefully you're getting on top of things and you want to think about prevention of, uh, of it coming back again. Oh, sorry, I haven't spoken about resection. Resection sometimes with a white line, um, CD toe is, is a necessity. Um, but we like to try and avoid it where possible. If you can access all the dead tissue to get it out and debride it from the surface of the foot, then we consider that better um, because you keep tissues in place that exert pressure on the uh, area you want to regrow. And when you have a hoof wall there, you have something you can pack against. Um, so packing material won't stay in a, a resected foot, but where you've just debrided out the dead tissue, you have a good area that you can plug and that usually gives the, uh, 
the highest rate of regrowth. It's not as satisfying, and you can't see exactly what's happening. Uh, but as long as you're happy that you or your clients are replacing the packing on a regular basis and checking that things aren't getting worse, uh, we prefer it as a, as, as a method. So it's a preventative measure. You want to Im improve the environment that the horse is in. Different, uh, hang on, that is uh, the wrong card. Excuse me. Um, microbes will always be in the soil. You're not going to be able to get rid of all the microbes. You know, you can completely obliterate everything from the horse's foot, but it is always going to be constantly being reinfected. What you need to ensure is that the hoof is in a state where no infection can really take hold. Uh, environmental improvement, such as keeping them in the dry, obviously, um, to give the horse strong hooves that aren't, aren't, a, aren't an easy target for microbes is the way forward. Obviously, we've spoken about nutrition, getting mineral balances right. So the horse is putting down quality horn that is less likely to become porous and is less easy to infect. Looking to improve the tissue density and the hardness of the, the sole and the frog and the white line particularly. There are obviously hardeners and conditioners that are regularly used. We know that formalin isn't necessarily a good idea because it might have unpleasant long-term effects. Um, Venus turpentine is qu quite a strong solvent, so you risk breaking down the lipid barriers. There are more natural options like weak fruit acids, like uh, citric acid, uh, acetic acid, lemon juice or cider vinegar, can have a very good toughening effect on the feet. There are proprietary hoof hardeners that contain these active ingredients. Zinc sulfate, as well as being a very good antimicrobial, is a good hoof hardener as well. There are particular essential oils, uh, MSM, lemon oil, LME oil, um, in particular, that are very good at hardening feet, um, and MSM, which is organic sulfur. All of these can be applied topically, have quite a rapid effect at hardening, and really don't do long-term damage. You want to do everything you can to avoid antibiotic resistance. So regular treatment of thrush with a, an antibiotic, not a disinfectant or an antimicrobial, I'm, I'm talking about oxytetracycline, teramycin, which are available in proprietary foot rot sprays, for example. If you are using that on a regular basis where you know there will be constant reinfection from the environment, you are really promoting antibiotic resistance by killing the bacteria that are vulnerable to those active ingredients and leaving behind the ones that aren't. Um, especially in things like white line fissures, where it's likely that the problem is fungal anyway. Um, so an antibiotic wouldn't be advised in those situations. Oh, bit of a jump there. Um, using treatments that last. Obviously, you know by now that we like clays as an application method um, because they stay in place for a long time, continuing to treat. They can also contain quite a high level of active ingredient within them without having to be put through a spray nozzle, for example. Um, so you can put more, for example, zinc sulfate in a clay than you can a spray. Um, Saying that, it may be the case that all you can get your clients to do is use a spray, in which case you just, you just have to go with that. They can still work very, very effectively. Um, but needless to say, the longer lasting, the better. It's an example of a clay application on the left and a spray application on the, on the right. And needless to say, uh, the one on the right is the easiest to apply. The one on the left is going to last the longest. And you have the addition of that drawing effect, which will help you out as well. Using something that stays put 
underneath shoes and especially underneath pads. Um, so nowadays, a lot of farriers in the UK are using a clay putty, for example, around the white line before they place even just a steel shoe on, uh, especially if there's any sign of, of white line disease. It, they tend not to use it preventatively. Um, but if there's, as soon as there's the slightest sign of, of infection under there, because a, a, a shoe or a pad creates a fantastic moist, um, anaerobic environment for microbes. They've got their food source there. They're never being rubbed off by traction. Um, especially uh, dental impression material, which is a fantastic ad advance in, uh, in dental, in um, farriery padding, but it makes the foot sweat like crazy. Um, this example is a, a former hoof shoe. Um, so obviously this is a shoe. You sh show some people on Facebook and they go, oh my God, you've ripped a horse's foot off. Um, on the left, before this former hoof was applied, a thin layer of, of artemud, which is clay, um, zinc oxide, honey, eucalyptus oil was applied. And thankfully the farrier decided he wouldn't put any on the other side. And it's given us a fantastic example of the, the difference between using a clay preventatively and not using a clay preventatively. Yeah, so the, long, the longer these preventative me uh, measures stay on the foot, the less concentrated they need to be, uh, which means the less harsh they will be to, to um, the healthy tissue that you want to be helping along its way. Um, right, so in summary, many of the, the microbes can be treated in, in very much the same way. Um, we're not too worried whether they're fungal or bacterial. Similar active ingredients can work and similar protocols can work. Do no harm is, is the main take home from this. Um, we need to be very wary of, of two traditional methodology. We need to be wary of our clients going on Facebook and being recommended to just use household bleach on thrush um, or peroxide or, or, or full strength iodine. Um, uh, we need to guide them a little bit more towards things that are gonna have a long term beneficial effect rather than just fizz and spit and make the horse jump around and make them feel like it's doing a, re doing a really whiz-bang job. Um, drawing out infection is so important and, and very easily overlooked. If we just treat the surface, um, it, it, it follows reason that microbes would retreat away from the surface of the foot. Um, so they will retreat into the cracks where the treatment is not. So we need to do what we can to close those cracks, but to pull everything we can out of those cracks, the dead matter. Um, maggot debridement is a, is a, is a new thing that, that people are starting to experiment with. Um, but often we're looking more towards the older traditional methods. Kaolin poultices, for example, uh, fantastic at pulling dead tissue that, on which microbes can survive in out of those cracks and then, and then, and then staying in the cracks to stop the reinfection. Um, removal of bacterial habitats, both on the foot and the surface, organic matter in the stable, organic matter wherever they're walking in the field. Um, we can't remove all our mud, especially not in a year like this. Um, but giving somewhere for the horse to go that is dry so they're not constantly standing on, on basically what is a, an, an anaerobic petri dish. <laughs> um, and that applies to the foot as well. You've got to stop that being a habitat. You've got to, you've got to harden it up. You've got to make it less porous for reinfection. Um, 
and the, the longer lasting your preventative measures are, the, uh, the better they'll work. Anyway, that uh, brings me pretty much to the end. I, I hope that's been useful. Um, I think we do actually have five minutes for questions, but if uh, we don't get to yours, uh, find me on the Equine Digit Support Systems stand in the trade show, it's just in front of the main doors, or pop me an email at redhorse at hotmail.co.uk and I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, does anybody have any questions on any of this? I don't know if I'm relieved or, or worried that I haven't interested you enough. Yes? Yes, basically. Um, so iodine is, is often used preoperatively um, to provide an, an, an almost sterile environment because you're going to be opening up basically the body cavity and you don't want infection to take place, removal of a keratoma, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, canker, copper sulfate, I think that's what you were going to ask when you put your hand up earlier on. But sometimes we have had, something I could never say in the UK, we have had clients that have had huge success treating canker with clay and zinc sulfate based products. They haven't had to debride with copper sulfate, which is fantastic news because it's, it's such, a, such an unpleasant and aggressive thing to do. Um, so it's worth considering just trying the, the, the gentler approach and it can have an amazing effect. Anybody else? No, fantastic. Thank you for listening to my drivel. <laughs>